Okay. But at least I don't feel like guilty. Recording has started. Cool. Yes, you do. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is our seventh brown bag in the Act 64 brown bag series. And today we have Caroline Alves from the NRCS uh, to talk about LIDAR data, data in Vermont. So with that, I'm going to turn it right over. Great. So um, we'll just jump right in and um, talk a little bit about uh, what is LIDAR, how is it captured, um, and talk about LIDAR resolution. We have one meter LIDAR in Vermont, which is incredibly great. And then I'll spend quite a bit of time talking on a, about a project where I use LIDAR to figure out erosion prone areas where gu gullies might tend to form. And at the very end, I'll get into talking about how um, LIDAR can be used um, to improve some of the GIS data that we have in Vermont. So LIDAR is uh, captured often in a plane, and the plane knows exactly where it is using um, GPS and satellites and base stations. And um, on the plane, it has an IMU, which I didn't know what an IMU was, but it's a intertial measurement unit. So the plane actually is pitching and rolling a little bit, like anybody who's been on a plane knows it's not a smooth flight. So that they even take that into account, because as the plane moves, you know, you're kind of changing your position. So, um, and LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. And there's a million different ways to spell LIDAR. Some people like it all caps or capital L, little I. Um, and the USGS has now decided it should be all lowercase. So that's what I tried to do in this presentation. I don't know if I caught everything because I spell it all kinds of different ways. But basically, you capture this information, and then you can convert it into um, 3D uh, image of a landscape. And the plane flies along and takes these scans and collects what's called a point cloud. And then it comes back around as a lot of different flight paths, and there's some overlap. And they do some magical processing. And um, it can be turned into, so <clears throat> it captures all these points. And those points, they know their x, y location in space, but they also know their elevation. So then you can make what's called a digital elevation model. Hopefully everybody's familiar with that. It's like a, a digital topographic map. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're basically collecting billions of points. I mean, it's kind of mind-boggling how much data is being collected. And the DEM is one of the most widely used um, products. And I've used a lot of slides from other people, and I've tried to credit everyone. <laughs> This is from uh, Jarlett O'Neill Dunn up at UVM. He's done some really great work. And um, so you can capture, as I was saying before, you know the elevation. So you can pick out um, tops of buildings, the um, ground surface, which people call bare earth. And you can get information about like tree canopies as well. And um, this is Mount Rushmore. <laughs> which is really cool. This is a LiDAR image. Like if you Google images LiDAR, there's all sorts of incredible stuff. And um, yeah, you can kind of pick out Abraham Lincoln pretty easily and Teddy Roosevelt and George Washington. I was like, who's that other guy? Oh, right, Jefferson. And so they should maybe have a denser point cloud because at least I had a hard time um, recognizing <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson. And <clears throat> like their eye sockets, maybe the light beam or the energy pulses didn't go, I don't know if they colored them black, but maybe they didn't capture so points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's why their eyes are showing up dark. But this is a, it's a really cool image. And just think about the billions of points in that. And this is, um, if anybody's from New York City, uh, Central Park. <laughs> so I don't, know, I don't know New York City that well. but uh, And they, they've colorized different uh, points at different elevations and different colors. So the lowest elevations are in blue, the trees are in green, and the buildings, taller buildings are showing up the tops in red. And you can almost pick out individual trees. You can see uh, foresters would be very uh, interested in this data. And um, I was kind of checking out uh, information about LIDAR to snag some nice images for this talk. 
And initially, they didn't um, capture, they only captured the bare earth, the bottom level, and they threw away all the other data. It was just garbage. And then some forester must have said, what are you doing? <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, th I thought that was really interesting that it was, it just used to be uh, the bare earth, the ground level that was uh, retained. So um, this is kind of a good slide showing, you know, the canopy level data. And here's the bare earth, and then you get some of the understory or different um, parts of the canopy. And then this image is showing, um, it's colorized, so you can kind of pick out everything the river and vegetation and so on. And then this is the bare earth. They've stripped everything off. And I, uh, my family's from England. My cousin loves to come over and hike over here. But um, he's used to the UK, and there's not many trees over there, so you get great views the whole time you're hiking, and it really bugs him. How <laughs> <laughs> in Vermont you're in the trees the whole time. So I could do some nice bare earth 3D images for him, and um, he could you know, pretend he's in the UK again. And um, a lot of LIDAR is captured from airborne sensors, but you can capture LIDAR on the ground. And uh, this is actually an island off the coast of Scotland, I think. They didn't say in the video, but... Um, and this village was abandoned a long time ago. It's out, I think it's called St. Kilta, and uh, they're probably doing this for archaeological purposes or something. But look at that image that they captured. Um, that's all from ground-based LIDAR. A lot of uh, points being captured there. And then in Vermont, where that red arrow is, uh, that's another ground-based LIDAR. This is along the Mad River. And um, Donna Rizzo, who's a professor at UVM, is doing some really cool work with her grad students. So they were capturing the Mad River, the configuration of the banks and everything, um, in a point in time. And then if there's another really bad storm and a lot of material gets moved or deposited, they'll be able to tell like how much material has been removed and how much has been deposited. And I'm a soil scientist, so I was there uh, digging a soil pit right along the banks, and uh, we sent that off for analysis to see how much different, uh, all the different layers, how much what the phosphorus levels are. Um, so definitely ground-based LIDAR is happening in Vermont and along the Mad River, as I'm sure everyone knows in this room, it's very dynamic environment, there's a lot of channel adjustment going on. You can see there's not much vegetation that's all been recently uh, flooded and so on. So I just want to give you some really nice visuals of um, resolution. So uh, when I first started doing GIS in the early 90s, like 30 meter you know, data was like, oh my god, this is so cool. But then when you look at one meter, um, LIDAR, it's like, oh, that stuff is garbage. Like, how did I do anything? So uh, <laughs> um, it's incredible the detail you can see with one meter LIDAR. Uh, you can just really pick out landforms and, and just see what's going on. And um, so this is a nice comparison. Um, and let's move to Vermont, uh, Essex County, Vermont, uh, that soil survey was done using one meter resolution LIDAR. So here's the 30 meter DEM, and you can kind of tell there's a ridge. You can kind of tell that's a valley, but if you look at the LIDAR, um, you can see in the valley just how smooth that is. That might be like an old glacial lake bottom. It's a very smooth deposit. You can pick out bedrock geologists, go nuts <laughs> over this stuff. Um, and just uh, look at the difference between the two. It's like putting on reading glasses when you're my age. It's like, wow, you can really see what's going on here. Um, and notice, like, you can see all those channels. Um, and that's probably of interest to some people in this room. You can actually see, like, where the river has meandered over time. So what do we have? What's available right now? Uh, in red along the Connecticut River Valley, um, there's not much available, uh, no data available, but um, I think more is being flown. In light blue, those areas are available. There's Essex County. I think that was maybe the first full county flown in Vermont. And um, dark blue is coming soon. And you can get on the um, Vermont uh, Center for Geographic Information, BCGI website, and click on those various areas and tell what the resolution is. Um, 
I was doing a project on uh, Lake Carm Lake Carmine. Carmine. <laughs> um, and of course, it was right between the one meter and the 1.6 meter. It was like pain in the neck. Um, <laughs> that, that always happens. And uh, someone had called me and I said, oh, just check on BCGI's website. They have a LiDAR map. And they call back, I can't find this anywhere. <laughs> so it is a little buried, but go under about BCGI. And then they have Vermont LiDAR Initiative. And that's where you'll find that map, which hopefully will get updated soon. So now I want to. Um, hone in on a project that I worked on. Um, we're doing this tactical basin planning um, kind of in conjunction with the state. And this is the Rock River watershed. And uh, we did three watersheds in Franklin County and one down in Addison. And I'll just talk about the Rock River watershed. Um, that's a land use map. Um, you can see a lot of brown. Those are agricultural areas. The purple is wetland. So it's <laughs> heavily agricultural. And I'm really enthusiastic about LIDAR. So um, in no way am I criticizing previous work and so on. I'm just really jazzed about what we can do with LIDAR uh, now. We can do so much more. And this is in the Rock River watershed. Um, the Rock River is colored in brown because it's impaired. And um, <clears throat> the initial charge for me for this tactical basin plan was to um, find steep slopes adjacent to farm fields. And the farm fields are in this kind of light beige yellowish color. And um, so initially, I was just going to blank out anything that was within a field. But as I looked at this, I was like, God, that's crazy. There's so much good information here. Um, and a lot of these gullies and so on are going right up into farm fields, direct conduit right into impaired waters. So, um, and with the one meter LIDAR, you can pick out actual gullies. It's um, really amazing. So the areas that are uh, lighter pink, those are gullies within fields. And then the darker, more magenta color, that's outside of a field, but um, basically just showing you all areas over 8% slope that are kind of hydrologically connected. And I'll explain that. So. Um, Lake Champlain uh, used to be the Champlain Sea in Lake Vermont eons ago. Um, so there's a lot of what is now dry land that um, was lake bottom at one time, 10,000 years ago, and so on. And this material erodes really easily. Um, so you can just get real erosion, sort of ephemeral gullies. Farmers can plow that out easily. This one on the right here is getting um, more to the size of a gully that's harder, that's a GPS unit, that little black thing, just three cents of scale. So, and that's a lot of material being washed off that field, a lot of sediment load going into rivers, and um, it really erodes. What, what's the soil texture of both those fields? Um, they're both, uh, the one on the left was mapped for Jen's clay, but it had like a silty clay uh, surface. And the one on the right was also mapped for Jen's clay, and that was more like a, a real clay. Uh, yeah, and clay supposedly don't erode. <laughs> um, but I have lots of pictures. <laughs> um, and so soil scientists talk about parent material. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term. Um, so we have glacial till parent material in Vermont. And uh, what do you notice over on this side, that green color? That's lacustrine. So that's just a fancy word for lake bottom deposits. And some of them go way up. Um, you know, into the interior of Vermont, but all the magenta and pink in that, that's all glacial till and dense till. But we do have in the Champlain Valley, um, and you can see from uh, on the right there, Champlain Sea took up a pretty uh, large area. And some of that um, are actually marine deposits, like salt influenced clays. We don't distinguish in our mapping, Virgin's clay can either be from the Champlain Sea or from Lake Vermont, which was, um, and lacustrian, I think, more properly should be used for freshwater deposited clays, but we call everything lacustrian. <laughs> this is up in the Rock River watershed. If you've ever driven up to Montreal in 89, you go right over the Rock River. You might not notice it. <laughs> it's kind of small. <laughs> but again, look at the erosion going on. That's Stacey Pomeroy. Some you probably know her. Um, works with Mike Klein. Um, 
And again, I use that greenish color, the lighter green on the map. Those are uh, silt soils, and then the darker green is for uh, heavier clays. And uh, there's another Regen's clay. It's got a gully forming in it. And um, so researchers at EVM are uh, finding that most of the sediment load originates in areas that are in close proximity to rivers and streams. Um, and so LIDAR is just a great tool for finding these uh, areas prone to erosion and gullies. And NRCS and our work, uh, I do a lot of things now. One of the things I do is I go out and do these compliance checks on farms, and we make sure farmers are growing the right crop rotation. And you have probably heard of Russell, um, universal soil loss equation and all that tolerable soil loss. And we're really concerned with sheet and rill erosion. If farmers do have gullies in their field, we have all sorts of practices and can help them repair that. But we aren't really necessarily monitoring for that. Um, so that's why using LIDAR is great. So maybe in some sense we're kind of barking up the wrong tree. That's what this slide's all about. Um, I love that little cartoon. I don't know, maybe deep down I want to bark up the wrong tree. <laughs> but there's a lot of, um, yeah, Google um, barking up the wrong tree. There's a million <laughs> Pretty great. Um, great cartoons of that. And so um, people may know Ben Gabos, who uh, has done some incredible work. And he saw I did a poster of my Rock River gully thing, and he saw that sitting in my office, and he knew all those gullies personally. <laughs> it was kind of amazing. I'm like, do you have any pictures? So he sent me uh, the slides from him. I should have credited him. So uh, right there are those two areas there, and you can see there's quite a bit of soil being moved off that field, and again, this is more like a silty clay kind of soil um, in Highgate. And um, Previously, uh, there was a Missisquoi area-wide plan, if people are familiar with that, um, and that's where that first analysis looking at uh, steep slope adjacency to fields. And yeah, initially I was just going to make the colors of the fields opaque, but it was very interesting to me to see there's a lot of gully formation going on within the fields, and a lot of areas are basically non-agricultural, shallow to bedrock, and they're showing up red. Um, in this map, which means they have steep slopes, but they're not really involved in the agricultural landscape. But this is, is really handy at a watershed scale. It kind of gives you a sense of, um, and the little locator map in the corner shows you the Missisquoi watershed. Um, but when I, I was kind of zooming in more and uh, trying to do more field scale uh, analysis, and so what I wanted to exclude were areas like where you have a little knoll in the middle of a field, but it's not really hydrologically connected. So in fact, there might be a little soil deposition going on um, as you change slope. Um, so I kind of wanted to exclude those areas because they aren't um, near any what I call flow paths. And I'll explain that more. What I wanted to find were gullies forming in fields that were then flowing into rivers and streams. So the, the map over there, um, there's a little knoll in that field, which isn't really involved in removal of soil. Um, but you can see that gully um, certainly is hydrologically connected to that field. And that photo illustrates exactly what I was trying to find. And so I thought. Uh, you know, using GIS, oh, a piece of cake, I'll just buffer around streams and rivers, and I will capture what I want to get. But um, unless I used a really huge buffer, <laughs> things are going to start running into each other, I wanted to get those areas. So I was missing, you know, I kept trying different things and different buffer widths. And some of the water layer is actually incorrect, if anyone's used the NHG. Um, so how do I catch um, those areas that are too far from what we call, in NRCS we call them blue line streams. I don't know if you guys use that term here, um, that I, I wasn't getting with my initial buffering. And this is um, flow accumulation. It's a really cool hydrologic tool you can use with GIS. And this is with the one meter um, LIDAR data, and it's amazing. 
I mean, when I first did this, I wasted a bunch of time just staring at this. I mean, this is almost like art to me. <laughs> it's really cool, and if you look at it, like, look at the, what do you notice over here? It's like a real linear pattern. So that's a farm field, so we're picking up, like, furrows and things. <laughs> and then over here, this is more natural vegetation. Wow. Um, so it's stunning to me. I don't know. <laughs> Easily amused, but um, <laughs> it's really cool. And... Uh, it was really fun doing this project. So just to explain flow accumulation a little bit more, each cell you know, knows its x, y, and it knows its z value, its elevation, and it can sort of keep a running tab of how many other cells are flowing into it. So this one right here has 20 other cells flowing into it. So then you can sort of start making these flow paths. And then if you like to think in 3D like I do, you, know, you can see that water will flow downhill, obviously. <laughs> so. That just gives you, um, you know, a visual on how that um, how that analysis happens. And this is a picture from out west, and uh, but I thought it really illustrated the whole flow path concept really well. So these aren't all individual little streams; they're just like if it rained really hard and the ground was saturated, this is how water would flow. Or if this was all bedrock and there was no infiltration, but eventually all these flow paths coalesce, like that probably is a stream. And you can see a road here, and somehow it takes into account that road. It's not all piling up at the road. However, <laughs> um, when I was doing this analysis, um, you know, it does flow over the road, but it doesn't really have the culvert um, elevations built in. And at first, um, you know, I saw these green lines coalescing. I was like, oh, my God, I did something wrong. But I realized um, these are really wet areas. Um, and again, like the way flow accumulation works, it's just sort of assuming all the water flows over the land surface. And, of course, in sandy soils, there'd be better infiltration and so on. But it's really useful just in terms of kind of a, a gross level um, analysis, looking at where gullies and erosion might occur. So what's going on here? You just, in that last slide, you kind of, um, so it says, assuming no drainage tiles to change the hydrology. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's a little bit of a problem. Isn't it? Right. But again, um, you know, we do have times when the water is, I mean, the ground is so saturated with water, not this spring. So sometimes, you know, the drainage tiles can't keep up. Yeah. And mentioning drainage tiles, <laughs> I'm really glad you brought that up. See these kind of weird patterns there? Mm -hmm. Those are drainage tiles. If you catch um, the ground at just the right moisture content, when they flew that, this is Bing imagery, you can actually pick out. You can't always do it, but you can. And, you know, they're kind of weird patterns. They're not like, especially when they're like herring bones, you can tell it's not a natural uh, phenomenon. So you can at times pick out the drainage tiles. Um, so I pulled up the NWI, National Wetlands Inventory, you know, and that uh, green blob there is showing up as a NWI wetland. And because I don't have the culvert elevation kind of burned into this, water is kind of piling up at the road. But this road isn't like some huge elevated highway. It's only slightly above the ground surface. So, um, but it is indeed a really wet area. And then over here, um, that's another, just looking at the aerial photograph, you can see that moisture right on the aerial photograph. And I think this is an old um, manure pit, which, which doesn't, if you look carefully, you can see it on the aerial photograph. And then over here, there's a lot of those green lines coalescing, and you can see it's wet, and that's why they put that drainage tile in there. But um, the green lines are showing you basically every little rivulet, you know, um, and I didn't want, that's like information overload for what I was doing, but it's very informative. And in terms of like wetland determination and everything, I think it's um, really helpful. We're finding old manure pits. <laughs> they show up. So the blue lines are showing the dark blue lines. Those are the main channels that I pulled out. You set a threshold and you pull out the major flow paths from your flow accumulation. And just to point out, here's the NHD stream, which is correct here. But um, when you set this threshold, it just goes to kind of the first place it finds, because this is so flat. 
So you can't automatically take um, flow accumulation and correct the water layer in all cases. You can use it um, for a lot of that type work. So when I um, ran a buffer um, of the steep slopes around the flow paths, I did indeed get those gullies that I was hoping to capture when I was just trying to do the buffering the, the streams only. And I just want to point out, no data is perfect. This is actually a barn wall that's showing up um, as a steep slope. And this should be like bare earth, ground surface only. So um, you, know, you always have to kind of, especially when you see rate angles, um, that kind of tips you off. Um, and these are, uh, there was a bunch of critical source analysis done a long time ago, or not that long ago, I guess. But, uh, and that kind of generalized things. But now with one meter li LIDAR, um, you can see the actual spot where we're losing soil. And I just wanted to show how I, uh, on those steep bedrock areas that are not really involved in agricultural production, uh, I wanted to use landscape position, but I was kind of running out of time. My boss was like, we need this now. So <laughs> I just used uh, the soil map, which I'm very familiar with, and pulled out areas that were shallow to bedrock, because that's essentially the top of the landscape. So um, I uh, just excluded those, the yellow areas on the right-hand side, from uh, my analysis, because they're not really involved in soil erosion or in farm fields. So um, to really tackle the water quality problems in Lake Champlain, um, I think LIDAR is the way to go. We can, um, you can really pick out with incredible detail. You can do kind of precision conservation. They keep talking about precision agriculture, but I noticed somebody was using the term precision conservation. Where are those areas where we're losing a lot of soil um, and like this field here has a lot of areas that are over 8% slope. Um, so hopefully that's not over fertilized. Hopefully it's not in continuous corn for 20 years. That would be a good place to encourage a buffer being planted or uh, you know, putting in um, different crops other than corn. And this is what the mouth of the Rock River looks like. I don't know if ever, anybody's ever been there in September, August. I worked uh, taking soil samples in 2008. Um, and that's what it looked like then. And uh, that's what it looked like last summer. I mean, a squirrel could practically run across it. It was in really bad shape. Um, when I first started working there, I was like, wow, we should get the canoe and go canoeing up here. And then after that summer, I was like, uh, <laughs> like <laughs> there's a lot nicer places to go. Um, and I don't know if you can see that picture, the three of us working, soil pit, but in the background, um, the river's just brown. It runs brown. It never cleared up in the summer of 2008. And I have a friend who works at the health department. I was talking about the Rock River one time. She's like, oh, that's where the blue fish came from. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so she sent me this picture. And I was like, ugh. And you know, I don't know if that has anything to do with um, the water quality, but it's a little shocking. Yeah. And there's a tall drain and lacustrian soil eroding away that pasture is in the Rock River watershed. Hopefully, I, I think that's been fixed up since. Um, and UVM, I mentioned them before. They're doing this really cool research. Donna Rizzo and a lot of grad students, Kristen Underwood and Scott Hanshaw and a bunch of other people. And they're trying to come up with like a sediment budget. They're trying to figure out what, what are the sources of this sediment. And they're beginning to fill in these numbers. And um, again, LIDAR is extremely useful in um, figuring out this picture. And so uh, you've seen the slide before, but it, it lets you see you know, what areas are of uh, farm fields are hydrologically connected to rivers and streams. And those are probably the areas we should be concentrating on, trying to reduce sediment load and um, keeping contaminants out of water. And the Rock River watershed is a heavily agriculture uh, area. People always say, oh, Vermont's 70% forested. But in parts of Addison and um, Franklin County, it's more than 50% agricultural. Mm -hmm. So um, that is definitely a big part of the sediment problem. 
And then just uh, to wrap up, talk about some other uses of LIDAR. Um, and I'd mentioned the water layer. Uh, and we're starting to use, at least in NRCS, um, and once the RAPs come out, um, it seems like the water layer is going to sort of turn into this regulatory um, layer. And some of it's in the wrong place. And a sure way to lose credibility with farmers is <laughs> showing them a map. And they're like, that's not where the stream is. So <laughs> here's the stream channel. Whoa. Later. It's touchscreen. Um, it is a touchscreen. Yeah. The yeah. stream channel's up there, and the, um, the, the NHD water um, is in the wrong place. So I, mean, I have a million examples. This isn't like the only problem. We're defying gravity there. And then anytime you see water flowing in a straight line, it's like a minute tip off, like something is wrong here. <laughs> it could be a drainage ditch, but again, the coding is wrong. And then again, we're defying gravity, jumping over that little knoll there. Um, so there are a lot of problems. And now we have LIDAR, they show up in a very obvious way, and we have the means, and hopefully, uh, you know, funding will be. Um, obtained, and there's always a rivalry, it seems like, between Vermont and New Hampshire, so I thought I'd bring this up, because <laughs> New Hampshire has gotten funding from USGS, and they're um, fixing up headwaters in their water layer, um, but I thought that was kind of interesting they did that. Here's a uh, mouse off the black. What's that? The mouse, if you move the mouse off the black, the oh, little bar will sure. Nice. That's good. Thank so. you. All right, thanks. <laughs> so the, uh, they did a buffer around their existing stream layer, which is in blue. And then what shows up in orange, um, they probably ran flow accumulation. I haven't read the whole article, but I like this picture. So they're finding areas where from flow accumulation, it's adjusting the stream channel is pretty far away from where um, the blue line streams are. And you, like I mentioned, flow accumulation and the stream layer will never be an exact match, but it's a great tool to sort of figure out some areas that are incorrect. And a uh, different topic, I mentioned salt-influenced clays. Um, and I've been working with George Springson, if anybody knows him. He sent me, um, kind of gone back and forth a lot, trying to figure out where all these ancient shorelines and the Champlain Sea and Lake Vermont and so on. And this is a uh, shoreline of the Champlain Sea and turquoise. And then look at the LIDAR. What do you notice between this side and that side? I mean, it jumps, at least to me, <laughs> it jumps right out. That's a really deep clay deposit. It's sort of masking all the underlying bedrock. I mean, I can practically hear waves crashing. <laughs> and, and this, I don't know, that looks kind of ocean-like. Um, formed by the ocean. I mean, and that's, he wasn't using the one meter LIDAR to come up with that shoreline. So that's pretty cool. He was really close. I mean, I think it means, you know, a teeny bit of adjustment. Yeah. But um, this is really, really cool stuff. You're still a scientist anyway. And in Quebec, um, they have these things called quick clays that um, are very unstable. Like the salt has been washed out of the clay lattice. And they just give away, so that picture down at the bottom, they have these huge landslides. And then along the Missisquoi River, there was a gigantic landslide. Um, and there's a lot of clay. It's probably marine clay. And is that a quick clay? Who knows? No work has really been done on that, um, but interesting. Um, and again, I stole some more slides from uh, Jarleth at UBM. And that was this was derived using photogrammetry. <laughs> but um, you can like take this accurate DEM and then kind of fill up the landscape with a flood, and you can see which houses are in danger. Wow. Um, and he, that isn't LIDAR, that picture I stole from him, but um, I'm just trying to illustrate the technique you could use. And again, um, I pointed out before that all those channels um, along that stream, you know, is that a good place to put a manure pit or a septic system or a house? No. And now with LIDAR, it's like we have x-ray vision. We can pick these out a lot better. And that's the end. Cool. <laughs> Over or short. No, it's perfect. Thanks, Caroline. So if anybody has any questions, um, this is the Rock River. Again, always runs brown. And uh, total lack of buffers. <laughs> I think that's been fixed since. I need to go back and take an after picture. But... Yeah, that's kind of close to the river. Yeah.
for the winter. <laughs> I have a question. How many flights does it take to capture an area? Like, you have to do that whole red block along the Connecticut River. How long will that actually take? Yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't know those sorts of details yeah. very well. Um, do they do, like, multiple flights? Yeah, I mean, they... Um, they go back and forth. Yeah, I think it took them just, like, a few weeks, but you have to catch... You have to get the right weather. Yeah. Um, but Essex County, I mean, that was flown in, like, one... A few months. Oh, wow. And they have really bad weather. Huh. Cool. For these purposes, are they still taking the flights when the, the trees leave out? It was still done in early spring. Yeah. Um, bare ground elevations. It would be either fall or spring, but leaf off. Yeah, leaf off. Before snow. <laughs> but if you're a forester wanting to know, you know then you'd want it. Um, right. Sure. So, and I know, like AOT, they've done even more detail. They just fly the um, road corridors. They have some really incredible stuff, but it only goes out, you know, so many hundred huh. feet from 89. Right, right, right. Huh. You say one meter resolution? Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? Because aren't you getting a lot more resolution than three? And a half feet or so. I mean, it's that's the spatial grid for the elevation. Yeah, each grid cell. So before it was like 30 meter square, you know, probably bigger than this around. And then like one meter is like half this table. So that's how you can pick out those gullies. Each square on your, you know, DEM grid. I mean, it's a really huge difference in, in resolution. And sometimes, a lot of times, a one meter is just like so much data. Um, you know, it really grinds down your computer and so on. <laughs> but I wanted to use the one meter for my purposes, but sometimes you can sort of degrade it to be like three meter or five meter just for you know, ease of computation and so on. And, and what is the, the contour elevation that it ultimately produces with the DEM? Or are we talking just inches? I mean, there, there was a, a couple of photos, there were a couple of photos we actually saw Almost like where the where the, the fields have been plowed. So that can't yeah. be three or four inches of elevation difference, and it's picking that up. It it should be like one meter, but it is. It it seemed to pick up finer detail than that. Yeah, um, the, the statewide lidar right now is, is typically resolved to a two foot contour. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, but, but they're hoping to put out a one foot statewide. Gotcha. But it's it's kind of pushing the resolution of the data. And that's, one, that's foot, one foot pushes the. the yeah, um, and in part of it's an issue of, of how many how many times it hits the ground within your one square you right. Know, plot. Right. And, right. You know, and so um, you can end up with a lot of a lot of information on a, on a field, but in the woods you won't hit the ground once. You know. Right. And it's so, only that right. rear gap in the trees. And I know in Essex County, I mean that was done pretty early on. I noticed that VCGI map called it out of date. I think or some other map I looked at how to categorize that way. There are a lot of really dense, low conifers in Essex County, and then there are also really big, huge boulders, and they were having a hard time resolving, is this a boulder or is this dense conifers? And for soil mapping, we actually have an extremely bouldery map unit, so we wanted to know if those were boulders or trees. Um, and I know they, they did have some difficulty with that, because like, yeah, just a an energy pulse bouncing off something isn't going to know if it's a tree or a rock. So, yeah, yeah. so I'm a basic planner for the wild basin, and I'm working with one of our GIS analysts on uh, uh, wild basin and looking at all the UVA parcels, um, for for forestry, yeah, and identifying areas based on uh, slope and soil erodibility, and then connection to the NHD layer streams to identify areas that are sort of sensitive areas that the foresters and doing the forest management plans for these parcels can look out for. And I'm just wondering if you think that once we have the LIDAR, it looks sort of a oil, we'll have a good portion of it, but it looks like way over to the east we might not have it until we get to Connecticut. And that's where a lot, a lot of oh, forests are. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you think that the LIDAR will make that data that much better than the data that we're using now? Because I'm assuming we're using the, the DEM probably from the 30 meter, I don't know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah and in terms of, um, I could give a whole 45 minute talk on like fixing up soil mapping, I mean, LIDAR is gonna be 
like Essex County, if you're doing any work, those are the best soil maps we have in the state because they use that one meter LIDAR. And they did a lot of automated processes before they ever went out in the field to kind of figure out where wet, you know, wetness was collecting using wetness index and things like that. Um, and some of our slope breaks are, you know, on our soil maps are off. <laughs> Um, and hopefully our conservationists going out to farm fields, there's been some reluctance about you know, using LIDAR. You should be out there with your clinometer measuring slopes and everything. But, um, you know, attitudes are starting to change. Um, and that one field I showed you with all the pink in it, I mean, that's sort of, there's an awful lot of that field that's above 8%. But, you know, back in the day when somebody was out there with their clinometer, if you know what that is, it's a little thing we look through that I use when I was out mapping. Um, and you try and find the average slope and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when you're leaving up to human judgment, you're going to have some biases or make some mistakes or it might be Friday afternoon at 4.30 or <laughs> whatever. So, um, you know, LIDAR sort of takes out all that human potential for error. So in terms of soil mapping, um, and, you know, our staff keeps shrinking and we're not going to be fixing up the soil mapping anytime soon, I don't imagine. Um, but you can use the LIDAR to kind of double check, like, wow, is this all like 15% slope and the soil map says it's a B slope, like what's going on? You know, you can kind of use it, um, and I don't know what other data layers you'd be using, but um, it certainly would be a really great tool to use in conjunction and, and just doing GIS, you, know, you can pop the wetland layer on top of the flow accumulation layer, you know, and just really get a good picture. And like, if they all agree, then you know, you know this is a really wet area, this is a really steep slope, or um, and areas that there'll definitely be some stuff on the soil map that, um, you know, will have incorrect slopes on it for sure. And that sort of drives some of our other interpretive data. Um, so if we didn't get the slope right, you know, things fall into categories that maybe they shouldn't be. And we're also kind of reviewing the erodibility of soils. Um, like I work with my colleague Tom Billers, and we collected one sample in the middle of December, two winters ago, when it was freezing, and sent it off to Indiana to the sedimentation lab. And they like came up with this sky high number for erodibility for Virgin's clay, but it was one sample from one field, and then. Um, a professor at UVM, Joseph Gores, is running some this rainfall simulator, and he's coming out with some very different numbers. Because we have really high erodibility um, numbers for clays in Vermont and some in like Nebraska. He's kind of tidying up the database, wants to have it be more uniform, and we kind of jump out as this outlier. New York has the same values, and they were like, hmm, this doesn't seem right. So we're still, um, you know, doing Here's research. Yes, yeah. on that one. So, you know, things are subject to change. But I think LIDAR is, and just in soils where you see all those gullies forming, I mean, obviously there's an erosion problem. So hopefully we'll use it to correct some of our data, like, over time. And our hope is to either if they be enrolled as an ecologically sensitive treatment area hmm. or there would be special planning to make sure that there wasn't any logging on those steeper slopes. And it just sounds like the LIDAR is going to give us the best information, the most accurate information, because even though we're going to essentially give that information to FPR and then they'll send information to the landowners, it's still going to have to sort of be ground truth by the foresters that are, you know, making the plants. Yeah, and it's, you know, like I showed you, that barn wall got yeah. included in the bare earth, so it's, you know, ground toothing, and I, you know, I really want to get up there and you know, Ben seemed to be confirming, like, oh, yeah, that's a gully. Yep, yep, I know that gully. You know, like, it was good to hear right from him. He knew, I mean, it was incredible. Like, I, I didn't have any kind of locator map, but he knew exactly where that gully was just from the, the landform. Um, didn't we just fund, uh, I know we had a funding request from the Cold Hollow group, Cold Hollow Canada or something like that, to look at the forested gullies from the cold hollows to the Canadian border, which is in Sisquoi. Yeah. Did anybody remember, didn't we fund the project? So they were going to go take right. the LIDAR and go back and ch and do the field checking. Oh, neat. Huh. Uh, in the cold hollow mountains in that area? 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's the name of the group. Oh, I But I think that's also, isn't that kind of the extent yeah. of the LIDAR at this point? Which was kind of another question I had when you said statewide, it really isn't statewide because we don't have statewide LIDAR, right? So it's statewide. Right. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, there's actually contracts in place to, to finish uh, collecting. So we have a lot of blue, though. I mean, it seems like we're really get, the light blue is available now. But I know um, Reed Sims just gave me in the darker blue in Addison County. That's like in initial release form or something. So some of it's, um, and I know Rutland County is coming out really soon. But it's unfortunate, like that huge red area. That's a big part. So here's another another uh, job you could do. <laughs> so um, with this with this data, it strikes me that you know if you have these flow accumulation lines, whatever you call those, yeah, as uh, vector data, let's mm -hmm. say, and then you uh, you know buffer those, yeah, and uh, and then you zoom up your uh, resolution within a a parcel or a field mm -hmm. with regards to slope. Right. You could probably point out head cuts in yeah. soils of concern. Yeah, that, I think, um, you know, just that. And you can also include what's called whoops, stream power, which I didn't even include in my analysis. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what this is showing you. These are, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I haven't gone out there and checked. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can't touch it. <laughs> Um, you know, that's, those are... But, but within that, there's probably steps. Oh, within more. Cuts, you know, where like there's... Like finer resolution. There, there are places where there's actively, you know, cubic yards and, and beyond that are extremely vulnerable. Yeah. Unless there's stabilization steps taken. Right, right. And, um, and also just those areas right next to impaired waters, I mean, that's kind of why I picked this out, because that's... You know, that's one of the worst parts of the rock. I think the whole Rock River actually is impaired. But, um, you know, having a gully way up here, um, you know, that does eventually flow into there. But just especially right along yeah. um, the most impaired part, I mean, it seems like it might be worth convincing that farmer to, <laughs> you know, get involved in whatever it is, a wetland reserve program. or I mean, if... Um, if that's not, it might be a hay field. And we're doing this edge of field study. I'm not involved with that, but Kip Potter, one of my colleagues um, in NRCS, he's working with Stone Environmental. And they're finding, like, um, there's a lot of nutrient loss off of hay fields. I mean, they're generally considered <laughs> to be not as bad as cornfields, but they're a pretty big contributor. Can, yes. this, can this somehow be useful to farmers working on nutrient management plans? Um, and kind of put the right. and focus on the right spots. Yeah, I mean, that whole critical source study, which is more generalized than this, um, was trying to do that. And, but I think this is even better, because, like, you know, the I bet a farmer would be like, oh, yeah, that does. There's always a, you know, ephemeral gully that every year when I go plow there. And, um, and you could, you know, we're really uptight about letting our data out. <laughs> but... Um, that was called the CLU, all the farm field boundaries. Uh, but hopefully, that you know, with that cooperative agreement or whatever, you guys will be able to use that someday. But you can do a little report of every field, and you know how much is over eight percent. Supposedly, there should only be one third of a field over eight percent. But looking at this, <laughs> um, seems like a few fields uh, are more than that. Um, yeah, and so you could go you could go to those fields that have really steep slopes that are hydrologically connected, and maybe that's where you should concentrate taking soil samples, and if they're sky high on phosphorus, you know, like, whoa, you know, don't put any more manure down here, or, yeah, I think it, we could really target, because um, I think a lot of those nutrient management plans, you know, there are these huge, great big notebooks, I've never created one or even looked at one, actually, but... I'm not. I, I think they sit on shelves to some degree, um, unfortunately, in some cases. So this this would be just a nice way to highlight like this field could really be a problem if it's in continuous corn, and um, you know, and it, you know, this shouldn't just sit on a shelf in some report. I mean, we need to get this stuff out on people's clipboards, like 
NRCS and extension and mm -hmm. what do they call them? TSPs, technical service providers, and this is great information. Um, so this this is not available to basin planners at this time. They have to do it all over again. Is that? No, I, I mean I, this. Will, our planners um, are definitely going to be using this and. The main thing is like those farm field boundaries, we don't let those out. Um, but I would think, you know, all this other data is shareable. Um, and it, it, yeah. I don't have any of the LIDAR data, and they are critical source areas for the oil, but they're not the high priority right now. So NRCS will be working on those areas. Yeah, and I, I know like Agency of Ag has like the farm field boundaries, but then they don't have any of the attribute data. Because, yeah, we have this whole, I don't even know what it stands for, PII, Personally Identifiable Information. Um, so like a farm number, I mean, it's kind of crazy in this day and age, uh, you know, we have Google Earth, you know, you can get on and pan around and figure out where all the farm fields are. It's not any great big secret. And yeah. with LIDAR, you can tell where all the orbits are and they jump right out at you. I mean, yeah. We sort of haven't caught up to this era's technology in some ways, um, but the actual farm field boundaries um, and numbers and, um, you know, we're, we seem to be very reluctant to let that out. But it, but even just having the, the outlines, I think, would be helpful. And then there's that um, NL, let's get it wrong. Uh, acronyms I shouldn't work for the government. <laughs> NLCD, National Land Cover Data Set, whatever it is. Um, that has, you know, farm fields in it. And I, I looked around where I live because I know I bike around there a lot, and they had some millet fields. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't think so. But most of it's right. And there's, you know, Lewis Creek um, Farm right down the road from me. They have vegetables. That showed up as vegetables. So some of it's like huh. amazingly accurate. But like millet, and they had a couple other weird crops. I was like, mm -hmm. so that gets you pretty close. Um, how do they? How do they know that? Is that that's not from satellite? It's all remote sensing, I think. I don't know exactly how they make it. Full farm from a cornfield with a satellite. Somehow, it's probably from uh, the um, what's that? RCS does the flights, the, uh, the standard oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. NRI? Yeah, it's probably coded from that. You had a, a question in the back? Well, sometimes you can tell from the, the light signature, from the color. Right. And also just the pattern, like they have long, skinny rows of vegetables as opposed to like a big monolithic cornfield. Uh -huh. So you probably could pick it up. Huh. That kind of leads you just to, do you know, is this the, is this the end of the technology? I mean, is this what NASA's using? Mars, or is there any, I mean, it sounds like you know, we've reached kind of a limit in our software in terms of handling uh, data in the right. cloud. I mean, is there another technology that's going to up this another? Well, I'm sure the CIA has this like well, I'm that 30 meter. For, for you know. Yeah. Is there a need to go to a smaller size? Why not? Well, I know the <laughs> I know that that's always possible. But, uh, <laughs> That there's there's technological limitations. You can't handle the data because there's so much yeah. data. I mean, maybe right. Well, the, the, those limitations will be huh? Right. Like ten years ago, we couldn't imagine you know, that Mount Rushmore thing. That would have like yeah, made my computer be, die. Like, you know, right? <laughs> right now, it's like someplace yeah. we're gonna find it. We're gonna stop climbing and level off. Right. But, you know, the one meter stuff, to me, I mean, I'm just in awe of it. I think, you know, you can pick out so much. And, you know, if you made it three meter, but in terms of, like, head cuts and gullies and where erosion's happening, and now we kind of have at least a baseline from now. And then if you fly it, you know, five years later and you see those things have been sized, and you can calculate, you know, how exactly how much soil loss there is from that. Um, Again, Donna Rizzo's grad students, you know, that's what they're doing along river corridors and things like that. Or if there's been a big area of deposition, you'll be able to calculate that volume. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Over time. Yeah, over time. Yeah, you'd have to have two time periods. But. All right. Are there any more questions? I haven't gotten anything from online, but if there's any more, we can do that. 
Otherwise, we can call it a day. Lunchtime. Lunchtime. All right. Thank you, Caroline.